Some of the official results are rolling in as well as we have the exit poll for most of the results of the European Parliament election. So with that, we can start to speculate the direction going forward, how this might impact the European Union in the next few years. So with that, we're bringing in our guests to tell us more about it. Indeed, so now to join us to discuss this is Professor Eric Jones, Director from Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies, European University Institute. Hello, sir, and welcome to TVP World. Thank you for having me. So some official results are out, some preliminary po uh, polls are out. So that's like uh, just Ben mentioned, it allows us to speculate what kind of outcome do we see. So um, I want to pose a question that I feel like um, might be difficult, might be not. But um, what uh, do you think was the biggest surprise of these elections? Who is the so-called biggest winner or biggest loser? Well, <laughs> the biggest surprise of these elections was Emmanuel Macron's decision to call snap elections in France. I think nobody anticipated that outcome. In, in, in terms of big winners, obviously, that means that the, the national rally of Marine Le Pen uh, came out as a big winner. But I would also say that Georgia Maloney's Brothers of Italy came out as big winners. They pulled almost 29% of the vote and her right-wing coalition government got far more than it got in national elections in 2022. So she comes out very streets ahead. Right, and with uh, Le Pen and Meloni's victory, how do you see these elections uh, impact the future course of the European Union? Well, I think <clears throat> the, the political family that did the best was the EPP. And we're seeing the European People's Party consolidate its position. It is the unmissable party in any coalition looking ahead. Uh, and, and it will be able to build a coalition with the Socialists and Democrats and with the Liberals. So the expectation is that if it is able to do that, we will be looking at a slightly more conservative parliament with a slightly more confusing majority, uh, but, but, but largely unchanged, much less dramatic than we might have expected. And I would love to also now ask about, or I don't want to say speculate, because of course we do not know what, what's in the mind of all the voters in the European Union. It will be absolutely impossible with 400 million people eligible to vote. Um, but uh, looking at the situation and changing political landscape, do you feel like um, now uh, the reason behind this, might it be that this is a revolt perhaps against bureaucracy and technocratic governance from Brussels, or is it a protest to vote aimed at the EU or at the leaders? That seem to be unable to provide clear path to keep European nations secure and prosperous. Like, for instance, now we do see that in Germany also now uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz did not gain the momentum as he hoped for. Same thing with now in, happening in Belgium or in France. There is a, there's a, a, a certain anti-incumbent movement that has shown up. So a lot of national governments are being rejected, but your own government in Poland seemed to do well in this election. Uh, the Italian government did well, so not all governments are affected. I think the, the, the big result that we would take away is that green parties have not done particularly well, and the green political movement is shrinking. And that may be a sign of people waking up to the cost of effective climate action. Uh, that's unfortunate, we need effective climate action, but it sends a clear political message that politicians need to explain why we need that action and, and how we're going to pay for it. All right. I would like to go back to something you said earlier about uh, some uh, pretty confusing coalition going on in the European Union going forward. I think that is a very interesting take that you have. And of course, we are looking at uh, the Eurosceptic and Nationalist Party gaining ground in this election that might throw a wrench into things. How do you think the governability of the EU will be going forward with uh, this little bit of confusion going on? Well, it, it, it really depends on the cohesiveness of the EPP. If the European People's Party is cohesive, um, then there should be legislative majorities that can form relatively easily in the parliament on issues that are central and of central concern. Um, if the EPP turns out to be more fractious than we expected, and that is a clear possibility, um, then we'll have to look at other coalitional opportunities. And you are right to point out that both the ECR, the European Conservatives and Reformists, uh, and the, the ID movement 
are, are, are gaining seats. So the strength of the right in the parliament is greater, which leaves fewer uh, easy coalitions to form. Which I feel like leads me to my next question, because I would love to tackle now the EU uh, budget, the next budget. And some are getting the impression that the EU funds uh, so far were not used to solve uh, the problem that EU faces, that like long-standing German opposition to using German cash to develop nuclear energy, for instance. So do you think that this is going to change now with, like, like both of you mentioned now, the perhaps dubious coalitions that uh, are taking place? I think I don't think this is going to change, not because the EU is is a bad organization or the bureaucracy is inefficient, but because the demands on European resources have increased so dramatically over the last five years. I mean, if we add security into the mix with effective climate action and all the rest, um, then you realize that the European budget is just too small to achieve all of the objectives that the European Union has to accomplish. And I think that's going to be the big fight looking ahead. How do we establish priorities in looking at such important issues with so few resources to address them? Uh, you just mentioned uh, the EPP and their cohesion being a very key uh, issue going forward. And my question to you would be like, uh, what about the other direction? Do you think these more right wing or even far right parties will be able to find their cohesiveness in pushing their agenda? That's an excellent question because the right-wing political movements in Europe are not actually very similar from one country to the next. So finding cohesion within the right is going to be challenging and not just across ID and ECR, the two main right-wing political groups, but also within those groups. And we see that there's a large number of political parties uh, that are non-aligned and there are at least 56 members of European Parliament that don't belong in groups they need to be incorporated as well. And some of those are right-wing political movements like Fidesz from Hungary. Right, and um, I wonder, because um, we also do see that, of course, in these elections now, um, due to Brexit, uh, now uh, the um, United Kingdom did not, of course, take part in it. Um, But how does do the Brexit dynamics play into the current electoral landscape, to your mind? Well, when when the British left, they left just after the last round of European parliamentary elections, which meant that they took a number of European members of European parliaments with them. This is the first parliament that's been elected without Britain as a member. It's slightly larger. Uh, the number of seats allocated has slightly been increased, um, but but <clears throat> but it is different. I would I, I would admit that. I don't see any tendency on the right to look at Brexit as a huge success or or a model to be followed. Uh, On the contrary, I think most people are looking at the British as an example to avoid. And so I think that the right is going to work with Europe rather than trying to pull out of it. You mentioned earlier that the so-called right, far right, actually have very different agenda across different parties, different countries, and different coalition. So I'm actually curious about like the, whether or not it is about time maybe there's a rhetorical distinction between these party when it comes to discussing uh, these different players and to not kind of lump them into the same discussion in order to maybe stave off the possibility of them consolidating uh, uh, behind the fact that there is uh, another kind of coalition trying to push back against it. I think that's I think that's an excellent point. We do not have a good language in political science for recognizing when what used to be right wing extremist parties become part of the uh, political mainstream. And yet it's clear that many of these right wing parties are eager to govern and they want to become mainstream parties. This is what we're seeing in France with the national rally of Marine Le Pen. It's also what we're seeing in Italy with the Brothers of Italy and Georgia Maloney. And in in trying to recognize when they drop their extremism is a hard thing to accomplish because there's a lot of concern that we'll be glossing over some very extremist positions that we wouldn't want to ignore. Right. And um, uh, now when it comes to um, now the, um, let's say, uh, we still discuss now the the green energy, of course. But um, how do you feel like now the um, elections might influence the EU's approach to to climate change and green policies? If you can expand lastly on that. I think I think we're going to have a hard time finding majorities within the current European Parliament, the one that's being elected right now. So the new European Parliament. 
um, in favor of more aggressive, effective climate action. I, I think the, the, the political coalition for climate action uh, is, is simply not there. And so what we're going to have to do is, is focus in the European institutions on implementing the legislation that was passed under the new Green Deal of the last European Parliament, rather than trying to do uh, anything new looking ahead. All right, thank you, sir, so much for your input and insight and help us unpack this situation. I already feel smarter. Thank you so much for being with us on TVP World. Our guest has been Professor uh, Eric Jones, Director at Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies and European University Institute. Thank you, sir. Thank you for having me.